Welcome to Self Directed. We are your hosts, Cecilia and Jesper Conrad. And now it's time to welcome this week's guest. Got it. We're live. All right. You do the welcoming. You okay. Always do the welcoming. So today we're together with Martin Cook. And uh, the thing is, uh, we met back in Granada in 2019 in December. And beside his lovely curls and big I smile. In October. Was it October? To, to be annoying. To be annoying. It was October, <laughs> not December. It, it felt like a good December. No, it was October. Um, so and now it got all weirded out. I will start all no, over. No, no, no. I will. I will. I will. And you just got very attracted <laughs> to him. Yes. Let's face it. You okay. Play. It's a nice It's yeah. <laughs> a friend. He's Let's a good go man. Yeah. And and so we uh, talked and uh, chilled out for some time and uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, but what I was impressed by with you, Martin, was the day you said, hey, they have a woman's circle. Let's make a man's circle. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what was actually more impressing was that you participated. Yes. Because for you, it was like something like really yeah. weird, yeah. the circle yeah. word. Yeah, I didn't like that. That's yeah, funny. But because we're like real hippies and yeah. still we don't do circles that much. No, no circles. But why Why did you want back then? What happened? Why were you like, hey, let's make a circle for us men? <laughs> yeah, thanks for asking. And hello, thanks for having Hi. me. <laughs> so three and a half years ago, we were in Granada, World Schooling Summit. And uh, what a beautiful place to be. The connections were great. And, um, and there was a women's circle. And I was like where's the men's not because I was like where's the men's but for a long time I have been interested in starting a group this is not a group I've started that was perhaps the first circle but it was uh the invitation from Lainey who who runs that was she said what was it she said it's all about saying yes she's being mm -hmm. open to being open and I don't know if she quite said that but that is now almost like a mantra of mine I'm open to being open and it's uh, funny because I I say I try to be ready to be ready right okay getting ready to be ready <laughs> that's my thing you know now I'm ready to be ready yeah yeah <laughs> yeah coffee in the morning <laughs> right, so right please right. continue yeah no I um yeah so I've, I've I've thought about men's circles for a long time I suppose my my background over the last 10 years or longer maybe 15 years I've worked in adult mental health in the UK um, specifically in uh, helping people find work that they're passionate about so I'd work with people who are really miserable and uh, out of work or doing work they didn't like and a common common thread was loneliness really a lot of yeah. people are really lonely and um, I suppose I've noticed that it's a generalization but men perhaps find it harder to vocalize uh, emotions more broadly so I yeah part of my intention in thinking about men's circles and doing all that is really to address my own loneliness I'm really I, I like people <laughs> and uh, connections and and I also like it when um, when people feel like they can be vulnerable so the, mm. the thought of a men's circle that's that's really um yeah, it's good stuff, really. It's creating a safe psychological space so that men can open up. So, yeah, I did ha did have an experience with it years years prior, um, which was really powerful. Um, but, yeah, you were going to ask something. Yeah, it's just you mentioned now you started something. Because all I know is the men's circle at the World School Summit like mm. three and a half years ago. So what is it that you are doing now with it? Oh, uh, well, off the back of... That it's not it's not so much that I've started a men's circle or anything like that, but it was funny because we met in the October and then uh, the big C arrived, the Corona thing. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And a uh, bit of background was I was traveling with my family. I've got four children, and we were traveling around Europe. Uh, we'd actually been traveling for about five years uh, prior, well, four years prior to that. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't our, our intention to stop traveling, but it just so happened COVID stopped us in our tracks. Mm -hmm we were uh, we were traveling uh, people often ask about world schooling and travel and how do you fund it and what do you do in your work and our our line of work if you like was we rented out our house in brighton england south coast of england uh, on airbnb so that's yeah. what we did but we didn't do a normal version we did the uh, kind of supercharged version so every weekend we had 14 women having a hen party which is like a bachelorette party in our mm -hmm. house and of course that's okay. 
that stopped. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. COVID and then, kind of stopped that. It kind of yeah. stopped that. And then I then we were thinking, oh God, I'm gonna have to get a job, you know, like a job, <laughs> right? Yeah. But um the actual how how I got back into my line of work, it came about because of an intention that I had. I uh I for a long time too have been thinking about a podcast and um no doubt you guys weren't thinking about it just a few weeks ago it, it had been bubbling yeah away. it's been roaming around yeah. yeah 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 so it had been rolling around my head and I had the perfect person I thought I'm gonna interview this old dude you know he's in his late 70s and he's really into he's really into smoking rollies drinking wine women and god he's like he's perfect. a really perfect, perfect kind yeah. of like perfect yeah, yeah. I, I look forward to listening to that podcast. Exactly. Yeah. So he's called yeah. Roger. And I really, I didn't actually know whether Roger was alive. So I called an old colleague and I thought, <laughs> I'll find out if Roger's alive. And this is literally when COVID's starting. I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to get a job. But I wasn't thinking about that. I was like, I want to do a podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I called my old colleague and he, he picked up Martin. He said, are you calling about the job? I said, what job? He said, your old job. We need someone uh, now. So within a week, I had a laptop and I started back in my line of work through the, I like to think it's kind of serendipitous. I don't know. I was thinking about something joyful. Yeah. And the serendipitous thing came off the back of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's very often how it is. We have this saying, what if it was easy when things are like, if you, when you have this, oh shit, I have to get a job, then yeah. nothing works. But if you're like, let's go do something fun, then suddenly someone's paying you money for doing it. And yeah, and it's just sunshine and it's not all sunshine, but no, it's but, easy. But goodness does flow, I think, when you mm -hmm. are fearless. I wasn't fearful about getting a job. I thought I can just drive a van. I can do whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, and I had, hadn't had it in mind to go back to my previous work, which I really enjoyed. I really, you know, a bit of, yeah. it's interesting because I think when you, when you travel, like, you know, people talk about identity and who are you and what do you do? You know, that kind of, what, what do you do? Yeah. Um, and part of most people's identity can be bound up in their their work. It's it? a normal thing, but it is also, to be fair, what people do with their time. I mean, my answer would be I go for a long walk after lunch with my family. That's what I do. And and it, it it's a weird answer to the question, but that's what I actually do. And when you ask more normal people or people living a more mainstream life then what they do is they do what they do at their job because that's what they do most of the hours so it's yeah. not like a fake identity or it's a real it's real because that's really what you do it holds it holds you up doesn't it well, it's, yeah. it's part well, yeah. of who you are but it should yeah yeah, it's it's a psychological. It's like if you pull that apart, it's it would be uh, psychologically damaging in some cases. I think you know. But I think also it's real. If you go get up every morning and you yeah. make bread and then you sell it, yeah. you're the baker and that's yeah, what you're yeah, actually doing. Yeah, so yeah. you're the one feeding the the village or whatever the neighborhood with bread, and you 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 identify with this. I'm the baker because yeah. it's real. And I think this, it can be a very fake um, idea to say, oh, you can't identify with your job because then you don't know who you truly are. And and maybe you truly are the baker, you know? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I just think it's, of course, it's, it's, it's too bad if you know nothing else of yourself than the making bread part. Um, yeah the the professional identity but but it's not fake to identify with what you're doing all day i don't yeah. think so at least yeah it's you interesting at, at the moment all day i've i've stopped my work uh six months ago i stopped and i've switched with my wife um hmm? and and now i'm full-time with the kids so i'm i'm looking after feeding cleaning mm -hmm. talking mm -hmm. with playing with mm -hmm. moving around the children so yeah. interestingly what is your answer if yeah well that's what well, i doing? need you to ask me what do i do right? what do you do Martin? <laughs> yeah. thank you <laughs> what do i do well i suppose it's i've got lots of different hats on at different parts of the day but i 
I, I was going to say I look after the children, but that doesn't really, they mostly look after themselves, right? Yeah. You know, they, They're big now. They must be. Yeah, well, 12, 12, 9, 7, and 4. Yeah. So, yeah. Ish. Yeah. Yeah. Ish. And, 4 is uh, not exactly big. No, no, no. But he's, yeah, he'll be uh, big. But soon. he's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, carer. Yeah, carer, nurturer, questioner. I'm learning a lot as well, actually. It feels like I'm mm -hmm. going back to school, but I don't mm -hmm. mean school in the traditional sense. But so many questions come come up from just, I was just reading a book with one of my children. It was about Faraday and, you know, he, he Michael Faraday. What did he do? He was an inventor of, I, you know, I don't know. Um, I got I it wrong. Know. He got it right. And, and then I was reading a book and he said, what's the East? Meaning the East. And, mm -hmm. and then we got out the map and mm. we, we started and, and he said, well, it's just one big country as we looked at Europe and Russia and all of that and all these mm -hmm. squiggly lines that were made up. And it it just so many questions and it's so interesting just mm -hmm. being around children, if you allow the time and space for it, because they ask the most kind of intelligent questions. They do. Yeah. And our ageism, I think, is one of the big um, things we have to work with as unschoolers in, in mm. our de-schooling process and our personal development as parents of three children. This, I was just saying to Jesper yesterday in, in the van, we were driving, it was late, and, and our sons was, were playing a computer game, and they read out loud um, these, um, what is a tail bubble in English? Yeah, so when that. there is yeah. like subtitles, they read it out loud and, and they, they make voice acting. And our youngest is 11 and he read it out loud. And and I was just amazed by it because it's in English, which is not his first language, how he just reads it out loud. It's like nothing. And he's even making the acting and it's hard words. It's not like a little frog said hi. It's, it's complicated <laughs> stuff. It's this yeah. interesting game about, about psychology and it's like really complex. Yeah. And I was amazed by it. And then I had to reflect on why am I so amazed by it? The kid has been speaking English for five years and, and he's doing this reading every day. Why am I amazed? I'm amazed because of his age. Would he have been 15? I would not be amazed. Yeah. And there's this ageism thing. We have this idea that because they have this age, they're supposed to, you know, the questions yeah. cannot be intelligent from a four-year-old. That's what we think or yeah. are brought up to think. And why not? They can be really profound because they're without without looking through filters or lenses, mm -hmm. aren't they? They can be even unsettling. Like, yeah. shit, yeah. how am I going to answer this? Yeah. yeah, Martin, I have a question for you. Please. You've been a dad now for... One? Yeah, it is. it is based on my age. Yeah, no, I, I've been uh, at that now for many, many years. You have been for 12 years. Yeah. Um, in my life, I started out as the breadwinner, a guy with a career and different hats on. And, and that was part of my identity. But uh, my what I get from you is that you and your wife have switched on being who is at home um so how have you been in your masculine role have you ever felt the need to be oh i have this title or have you always been just cool with being a hey i'm gonna stay home dad this uh, now or... yeah i feel i feel like i've perhaps unusually always been very comfortable in the feminine and and being around women i suppose i've been quite used to I'm, i've got one younger sister i wasn't you know i wasn't the the youngest of five with lots of older sisters but yeah no I've never felt um the kind of masculine or machismo like I'm the breadwinner kind of thing I've always uh I suppose I've always my wife works in um in IT you know in data and so she's always earned a decent wage and all the time we've been together I've worked for charities or or the NHS that kind of thing so I haven't earned as much so I've been quite comfortable with that I suppose um and yeah, I I suppose I don't hang out with people with 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 men like that no. is the answer in part. Um, so I don't feel it just feels kind of normal. Actually, one of my best friends who I've known since I was five, he for the last four years has or five years has been the primary care of his children. And I've just moved moved house so I can walk to his house now. And it's um 
it, it just feels very normal um i mean i am interested in the role of of men in i'm i'm in childbirth i'm particularly fascinated by having worked in mental health it kind of feels like adult mental health it kind of feels like it's almost too late i'm fascinated how how we, the conditions under which well we, we're conceived and birthed and then nurtured and you know cared for in, in the sort of formative years I, yep. I find that really fascinating and um i was present at all four of the births they're all home births and the last two were actually free births you'd call them so intentionally no no midwives there but um i definitely brought fear into the room uh as the man and felt like i shouldn't be there it felt like a sacred feminine thing and it feels like like it's more of a modern notion for men to be um almost like a confusion that men should be there i don't know if we looked at it anthropologically whether men would have been there at the birth or whether it would have been mothers aunties other women like that so so yeah i have time. no idea actually how it looks like in in no, from an anthropological point of view if, if there are any traditions anywhere yeah i just felt like i was uh interfering like my my partner had had it you know she was there in her strength in her feminine energy and i wasn't going to really bring much to the party apart from a cold <laughs> towel and a glass of water uh, you want me to share the stories <laughs> of how uh, how yes we really supported yeah yeah i was there <laughs> no i was good at it i was good at it. i'm not going to share that no, no. <laughs> i was I, I was told that i was just kind of not getting in the way but you know she didn't need me yeah. um which is, I think that's amazing. You know, that's the feminine strength and energy and like, I think that's absolutely but amazing. Did she have like a sister or a friend or? No, she she's quite um, uh, independent. She did it, yeah, but you know, maybe she would like to have a sister in the room or? Yeah, well, interestingly, yeah, she hasn't got a sister and um, she recently said, oh, it'd be really nice to have a sister, mm. you mm. know, to, to understand, the, yeah. understand each other. Yeah. Have, have you got a sister? I've got three. Have you? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's complicated. Like because, of, because of an early divorce, I have like step and half and yeah. So maybe I only have two. Depends yeah. on how you look at it. I have two that I'm really close with that feels yeah. like sisters. Yeah. And I also have um, just as many brothers. So I'm like... Big family. Blessed. Yeah, well, it's two families. Yeah. Because my parents, they were divorced when I was uh, four or five, and they found the right one right after, and both of them married more children. So they found someone who also had children. So when very early in my life, I had all these step siblings or half siblings, or I just call them siblings. Yeah. Um, and then my mother and her new husband got one more child. So I have like one. I don't really care about the whole gene thing. <laughs> it's more about the feeling. Yeah. Um, and and some feel more like siblings than others. But... Yeah. yeah. I, I would love to return to the masculinity part. Um, and I am a very uh, pink uh, kind of guy. Uh, love colors and uh, I'm very happy with flowers. I love to run over to flowers and smell them. But if you just look at me, then... And you are like very, very fascinated by romantic movies. Oh, yes. Oh, and really? I like romantic yeah. movie and everything. Can't stay away but if you just uh, look at me and I wasn't smiling, you, due to my size, would think, oh, that's kind of a man's man. Uh, but uh, I'm very little a man's man. So back to this circle we had on the World Schooling Summit, we were sitting and talking about some of our vulnerabilities. And one of mine back then, we still... Um, had an idea if we should drive in the big red bus we had um i i talked and i was like but i'm so afraid that it will break down and there was um uh, and and i mentioned in this circle that i was really fascinated by men uh who you know can fix an engine uh, for me that's like magic i don't know how they do it but i'm very impressed me, by me it. too it's incredible it's like witchcraft yeah yeah <laughs> they they and, and they got grease on the hands and yeah. <laughs> sweaty and sexy and all that no yeah. but it's it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not sexy to me. no no but it's fascinating for me that they know how it works and how it fits together 
Um, and I, I talked with one of the guys in the circle about how I was afraid to even touch my engine on this big red bus we have. Uh, and he said something to me I have we have used as an advice later. He said, don't worry, you cannot fuck it up as much as a professional cannot fix it later on. Right. And well, that, you can, we say it nicer. We say it nicer. We say you can't break it so much, no one can fix it. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if but, it's broken already, you can give it a go and, and, and then if it still doesn't work, well, it didn't work to begin with. And then, then you call the mechanic. Yeah. But I've actually used that and then have changed something on the big old machine and tried to do it myself. I'm still afraid of it. But trying to do it was a, a, a nice accomplishment to to remove the fear of uh, breaking everything. Yeah. But how is this, you know, how is it? Because you started this out as a masculinity question. And what I think is it would be very healthy for you to let go of the idea that a real man should be able to fix the motor. I mean, let's just call the mechanic and not waste our time because we don't know what we're doing. I don't know what you don't know. It would be really feminine to to know about, I don't know, fashion or nail polish some things i don't know you know and and you be you and i be me and... yeah yeah but it's in kind of it's like put, it's two put, things it's, it, yeah but it's put down the true i've been programmed by society to think that men should be able to fix stuff when i was young um yeah yeah no well it's a really i think it's a really important observation that society well thinks that it's a masculine thing and it shouldn't be that should it it shouldn't be at all. It's not a gendered thing. Or it's statistically, should... more men are interested in motors than women. So yeah. I think it comes from that. But that doesn't mean that all men are interested in motors. And it definitely doesn't mean that all men are able to fix one. No. I'm I mean, terrible with motors and DIY and things like that. You know, I, I and we've just bought a new house and it's really old and it everything's broken. You know, like all the windows are rotting. It needs just had a new boiler. We, you know, we've got a digger out the back. We're having an extension built, and um, I would love to to get involved and do things. And I, I I changed a lock on a on a shed last week, and I I thought, yes, I'm doing it. It's in the rain. I've got the wrong drill, and then I triumphantly closed it and realised that I'd managed to screw it in wrong, so it's permanently locked again. Even without a lock, I'm just so terrible at DIY. So I was, I was telling the builders just yesterday. I said I'm. So, I was telling the, this story, mm. and um, I'm I'm kind to myself now, definitely. But I've it's it's been a long journey of of mm. realizing that it's not so much. Yeah, we can't be good at everything, can we? And um, I've realized with all these DIY things that well, we talk about all this maintaining the house and fixing the motor. It's mm. it's an education. And we yeah. should we should like really value that. I, I'm and loving. Some people don't have it. If you don't have the edge, none of us have had any interesting in in building tables or fixing motors in our lives, and we're closing in on fifty now. I mean, yeah. maybe we should just face it. Other people do that, and we have other stuff that we're good at because we've been interesting in it and been doing it all of our lives. You can't just build a, a, a drawer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> out of nowhere you know it, people who do that they have yeah. they have learned from someone and they've spent a lot of time learning yeah and yeah. that comes back to the whole education question where we have this traditional very wrong idea that academics are the high ranking that's what takes some intelligence and hard work and all the the things you do with your hands it's more like you know anyone can do that and it doesn't really matter but we're losing respect to people who who can do something that we, we all three yeah. can't do and we really need people who can do it so i have a lot of respect for people who can do things that are practical and indeed I, we've actually consciously moved so as to be closer to a place that we're quite heavily involved in local to us in east sussex the county of east sussex it's called wilderness woods so mm -hmm. it's a wood that was um bought about 10 years ago by a couple who were traveling around europe looking for a place of land to to be with their children and she's interested in alternative education and uh, what happens there are there uh, about 30 young people like 
under our age who live there and work there for free so that like woofing yeah you so they mm-hmm. they live on the land but they and they volunteer some of their time but they also uh, make things there so they make the drawer the table the there's a potter you know there's there's people that cook and it's a community and and our children have lessons there so my daughter now is just doing green woodworking so she's learning practical skills lovely which is so nice and I was just going to say um I think as a child it depends on what you experience right as what what you're around I I Mm. didn't have I didn't have people that I was around that were, were showing me things I mean my my dad did oversee building a house he, he managed the whole thing he wasn't laying the bricks but I was around that so that did give me a kind of um it, it has, has given me the desire to want to do that myself I have this desire to want to build something and so this thing out the back that we're building is a small version maybe in 20 years time Charlie and I and my wife will will build a little place in Scotland mm. probably mm. my ancestry is Scottish so I like the idea of somewhere wild with a fire very warm enclosed and I, I'll be involved in building it somehow but mm-hmm. I know that I'm not going to be a builder and, I, and that's fine that's fine and um, it's fine yeah I was actually invited I, I I studied psychotherapy um and perhaps like lots of people who study psychotherapy uh when you train as a psychotherapist, you have to be in therapy yourself. Uh, and I couldn't just give myself permission just to go into therapy. It was a legitimate thing. I had to do it. So I spent many years in therapy. And I remember early on feeling very upset about the fact that I couldn't change a lock or do anything, you know, crying about it, being really mm-hmm. like, why am I such a failure? Mm-hmm. And the therapist, he just gave me permission. He just said, you can't be good at everything. That's why we all do different things. You, you're really good at these things. Just pay someone to do that. Mm-hmm. And exactly. it was like, oh, it just it just gave me the permission to be kind to myself and to realize that we're not good at everything. No, we don't yeah. have to. Martin, how did you get into the whole traveling with your kids and alternative education? Um, because you have kind of stepped a lot outside the the normal road uh, from that is otherwise people travel i'll uh so if i start i'm about 14 15 uh i've all my all my family work in it i see the trappings i think money i want a bmw i'm going to study it so off i go to university i've got my grades i've been a good boy i've been educated but really i know nothing it's all gone in here and out here. I've remembered it. And um, I traveled for the first time when I left university. Actually, no, it was in a placement year. I went to America and I was caught up in 9-11, actually. I was in Washington when the when the planes hit. And I'm really passionate about photography. So photography gave me a reason to travel, really. Or it gave me something to do. You know, when people say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm traveling. I needed, I needed the more permission to be traveling in a valid way I couldn't just be as you said going for a long walk after lunch that'd be too indulgent (laughs) yeah that is actually what I'm doing exactly good for you you know that's loving nurturing and the ripple effect of that Mm -hmm. it just goes out into the universe doesn't it it does yeah and I would um I need to continue the the story you were so yeah yeah I needed photography to allow myself just to be just to Mm -hmm. come like a I suppose like a butterfly comes out of the chrysalis, you know, I, I I was like the caterpillar all trapped at university thinking, I hate this. I I just don't want to do it. I doesn't, it doesn't, I'm not very good at it and it doesn't feed my soul with anything no. great. Um, and I was really confused about the money side of things as well. I saw all the, the money, but I, I kind of knew internally. So it was a conflict. And, um, and so traveling and just being still with no purpose this is when I'm 21 22 23 it really was the first opportunity to sit in that stillness and kind of find myself and uh, I went when I was 23 I went went on this charity expedition uh, called Rally International it's a charity in the UK and they run adventure projects and community projects around the world so I went to Borneo for three months and it was a really really formative experience I was 23 and most of the uh, people there were 
17, 18. So I guess I was an elder amongst the, yeah. the younger ones. And it was there that I found my vocation, really, which was, you know, we'd be on a building site in the rainforest building this library and all these kind of 17, 18 year olds who were off to university I really identified with them because I'd kind of been there and I just found mm. myself listening to a lot of them. And I just really enjoyed that kind of listening role. Yeah. And I guess I always think about jobs in terms of the village. You know, what would we have done? There would have been a baker, wouldn't there? And yeah. there'd have been a magician and there'd have been the woodworker and the this and then that. And I've, I, I think my role, what do I do? I'm a listener and I'm a connector. I really love to connect people up and, and join the dots between people mm -hmm. uh, so yeah I really enjoyed listening to young people and I came back with the passion for photography and almost immediately I said right I want to go and be staff for this charity I want to go and volunteer again but as running the project and so I went back as a staff photographer uh, in Costa Rica and Nicaragua and I mm -hmm. was I was given a Land Rover and my camera and they said go off and photograph the two countries and that was for three months and it was amazing you know getting getting s stuck you know in the Land Rover down swampy lanes and getting towed out and just stories abound experiences and that's where I met my wife so day one I'm photographing everyone getting off the bus for a little ID card and Charlie walks off and she just quit her job six months prior had been traveling around Asia and was doing this thing and we met and we traveled afterwards so Charlie and I met traveling yeah. so that was I suppose both of our DNA we we got traveling and it wasn't a conscious thing to travel with our children uh, but sometimes life has to get tough to or, or rather we we consciously or subconsciously engineer the conditions to make our life more difficult in order to push or guide ourselves towards our true path I mm, think. Mm, so mm. so we were living in London we were visiting Brighton every weekend oh Brighton's great it's on the south coast it's a great city why don't we move there so we moved there but I was still working in in London commuting you know two hours each way oh shit right so you've got, <laughs> you've got a, a three-year-old oh and you've got a, a little 18 month year old and Charlie looks at me and she said what are we doing why why are we doing this but we made it difficult and then we had to think right we need to improve this situation mm. what can we do and she said we could rent our house out and go traveling I said are you mad like you know like <laughs> what the are you doing? story we've had right tried that. yeah yeah are Same you mad? conversation yeah mad. I'm, I'm definitely so Charlie's like the visionary like anything's possible and I'm I'm sort of not uh but I'll go along for the ride once mm. once I'm in it I'm like I'm there so she said that by I'm sort of coming up with problems like how will we afford to travel right as you know we'll rent our house out and I said but it'll only just cover the bills and the mortgage she said no 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 we'll rent our house out to holiday makers because they come to Brighton all year round it's very very busy and I said okay um all right get the person around we'll find out how much money we could get and it was like let's say it was two thousand three thousand pounds a month it still wasn't enough to travel I thought well no so she says I've got this man he's coming around he does hen parties and uh, have you heard of a hen party or a yeah yeah. Yeah? yeah yeah I know what it is yeah right so yeah it's basically a massive raucous party where you know like the the caricature of it is is women walking around with like learner plates on and short skirts and being loud and all that kind of thing letting their hair down and charlie said there's this guy coming who doesn't do holiday homes he does holiday homes just for hen parties i said no way no way what like and at the time i thought it'd be like eight women because we only had a three bedroomed house it was quite tall and thin but he arrives and I, he's a geezer. He was like, you know, in his flash car and he starts walking around our house and I'd already decided no way. And he's counting people. He's, he's looking at the floor and going two, four, eight. And I was like, what's he doing? He's counting how many women he can fit in our house. And um, 14 was the number. And we did it. We did it. We, we, we went with Hen Man, as he was called. We did that for a year. And he didn't pay us on time. The house was a state. When we got back from our first travels, which was we went to Southeast Asia. So we 
we had friends in Bangkok, soft landing, and then we went up through Thailand and Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we were in Bali for two months. We stayed in a beautiful, we just, just through connections, Facebook, you know, we found yeah, this really found lovely, yeah. lovely guy who was traveling back to the States and he sublet his basically a bamboo house open, you know, snakes and oh, monkeys yeah. and in Bali. And we were there for a couple of months. It was it was amazing, but it was also hard. It's it, I think it's really important, as you, as I think you said, you got ill on the road recently, right? And yeah. I think this is, and I've totally been there. You know, anyone who's travelled for any length of time is mm -hmm. going to get ill. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a yeah, thing. Well, it happens sometimes. It happens. It does happen. You realise this too. virus we had was actually all over Sicily. Right, yes. Yeah. So so it wasn't it was not just us. Traveling. It was just because, you know, yeah. At the moment, there's this virus around, and we get it as well. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. But there's a kind of duality to 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 everything. Like people think, oh, you're traveling, you're having like your best life, and it's like, no, we're just living. Like yeah. we're trying to live our best life, and um, well, our premise is different because right. it's not in one place. It's not a house, and and the advantages are quite obvious i mean i i've, I've just been walking alongside blossoming mm. trees almond trees looking at the snow at the top of the mountains here in italy this morning with my teenage daughter it was beautiful mm. but but yesterday you know we were just roaming around looking for a place to park our van yeah. with in some weird it's not always amazing amazing yeah. is easy to describe and it's easy to take pictures of but the real life that we bring and maybe we we could call it obstacles or disadvantages they're a little mm -hmm. harder to describe but, but, but photographs photos, yeah. photographs are nice you know i i felt really conscious when we traveled you know charlie said oh we can we can have a better income traveling because we'll do a blog we'll be vloggers and things like that and and i just kind of felt like that wasn't the thing because it it wouldn't allow us to show a balanced or I don't know how many well some vloggers do but I did a very small photo stream just for an extended group of family and friends and I would take pictures of we like when we were in Bali we went to New Zealand and we bought a van in New Zealand it was an old VW Westphalia pop top mm -hmm. um, it was really really cool and I know and that one you know that one you know it was mm -hmm. brown with the the checkered the checkered thing on the oh, side. Beautiful, yeah. It was beautiful, and it was left-hand yeah. drive, and it was, um, yeah. And and everybody, my friend Tim, who lived there, he said, "You really shouldn't buy this van because it's a Volkswagen, and all the parts come from Europe, and we're here right next to Japan. You should buy a Toyota." But there wasn't the, there was a romance, you know. We wanted the van. The van turned up. It had a lovely story, and uh, so I drive the van six hours but I flew and then I drive it back and we put all our savings so we put like eight thousand pounds of savings into the van to live in I drive it back six hours and Tim and it was like this it's like mountains of of New Zealand yeah. and he said it's an old van it was like 38 years old or however old it was he's like you've got to take it easy just do like 50 miles an hour stop every couple of hours check the van I was too excited I just drove at like 65 miles an hour flat out triumphantly came home with the van and then the next day i drove into town and i park up and it's rear engine water cooled water cooled vehicle park up and there's all water pissing out the back of the van i was like oh what have i done i've i've, I've ruined we're gonna live in it it's too expensive to live in new zealand we have to be in a van you know we haven't mm -hmm. got the money coming in from the mm -hmm. from the hen hen house in my head we're screwed i've made the biggest mistake of my life it's awful right. and um and so what happens of course when you take a risk you get rewarded and we um i start ringing around i, I was like right i need the vw owners club for new zealand and i start speaking to all these old dudes on the phone and it, this name kept coming up oh you want to speak to this guy called marty he lives in blah and I look where blah is and it's 10 miles away from where we're staying on a farm with our friends and it turns out this guy's got six of them in his garden he's an air <laughs> aircraft engineer what he doesn't know about this particular model like he's like the best of the best yeah. and he spends the next two weeks every evening with me he's working during the day every evening I camp in his garden in the thing 
um because yeah. he's showing me how to how to fit a new cam belt and i'm just kind of nodding just because <laughs> yeah thanks <laughs> and he's like he's like you'll need these tools so i like buy the tools thinking i'll never use these like it but <laughs> he was um he was really and what a beautiful man he really wanted to uh make sure that the engine didn't crap out on us as he described it i don't want it to crap out on you but he wanted us to see his country that he was really proud of and he was just a really beautiful human being and i'll never forget his kindness and love in doing that and it really yeah that was and the van was perfect from that day onwards and it, the whole engine could have blown up if all the water had gone it would have yeah exploded gone. Yeah. yeah all gone i like that one when you take a risk you get rewarded we really we really every time we've been in these it really resonates with me this you know now everything is falling apart this feeling something happens and and you're like okay this is the end of the road then something happens yeah always something happens there's always someone to help like oh, totally. right like totally, totally. like when, next to you they you've become gotta, themselves you, you you can't be tough with it like you've you've got to be vulnerable with it and yes, you've got to exactly. surrender yeah and yeah it's like you've got to let the love in, right? Yeah. Like you know, we just had a flat tire, and the story is the exact same. Really? Exact same yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a flat tire in Sicily. Right. And first, the we... day it was raining, but we got a warning sign, so we drove in, parked under, and so we wouldn't get wet. And like, um... but the thing that happened was first we tried with all the insurance yeah. and calling and handling it ourselves. Yeah. Because actually, in there was a guy pool. coming. Like, should he help us? And we were like, no, 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 we'll figure it out. And then after like 20 minutes of phone calls and WhatsApp and what have you, I said to this rescue lady on the phone who couldn't like understand the address, I told her, you know, I'll call you back. And then I went and talked to that guy who wanted to help us. He was right there. He was still right there. And and said, you know, in my Italian, <laughs> yeah. which I don't speak, um, <laughs> thank you very much. I would like to receive your help. And from that moment, it was like this. And we had new tires and, and yeah. fresh coffee, <laughs> everything. Yeah. But, everything. What, but you've, you've consciously chosen to take yourself out of your comfort zone. Exactly. By, by saying goodbye to a traditional life. And I think that's where the, that's where the, I love the film, the matrix, you know, mm. but, the, the mm. film Matrix perfectly describes for me the, the the conditioning and the world that most people are living in. And when you when you can see the Matrix and you consciously choose to uh, to uncouple from it, life does become more difficult on on many levels. But it's also not difficult. It's it's almost as it should be. It's it, you know the we, first guy who showed up to help us the first time. Our maybe it was the second. One of the first times the big yeah. red bus broke when we were oh, traveling. Yeah. 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 One of the first guys who, of course, there was a mechanic right across the street who could fix a, yeah. an old timer, of course. Yeah. And he came to help us. And this little part that, you know, hasn't been in production for 35 years, he, somehow he managed he to replace how it, to find it or to fix it or whatever. And when he left, I, I noticed on the sleeve of his t shirt, it said Angel. It go. did. Yeah. I was like, okay, okay, universe, yeah. you're talking to me, and I, I, I'll, I'll try to like adjust the the listening device. Yeah. So, so let's talk about um what what this is then. Would people have ever have people ever described you as lucky? Oh, oh. yeah. Right. I think yeah. this is fascinating. Right. So the the extent to which you 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 feel or one feels that you can make your own luck. There's um. I personally believe you can make your own luck. I mean, but just because I've had a lot of lived experience of having these lucky connections mm -hmm. or, you know, what people would perceive as, as very fortunate. But mm -hmm. I think it's when you're on in a flow state and on the right path, things just okay. kind of come to you, don't they? It's not luck. So how can we, how can we uh, share how to increase your, your, your luck? We have oh, a it's friend of Chris. It's complicated. Okay, we won't go there. No, no, we... <laughs> Let's do it. I love complicated. I'm just. Yeah. I'm not going to do it like in one tweetable sentence. No, but our friend Chris has a, a nice saying, 
uh, and it is about being in tune with the universe. Is it the intention, attention, no tension? That is also good, but it's not that one I was okay. thinking about. That's a good general rule that to be aware of your intention. Like, what is it? What kind of life do you want? What what kind of emotions do you need to like get rid of? Or mm. what is it we're looking for? To be intentional mm, and to be able to to describe it quite clearly to know what sounds wrong if I say to know what you want because that could be like I want to be a B W or whatever. Mm. It it's more like it's a more emotional thing actually. What is your heart desire? Yeah. And and how do I want to feel? It's not about what do I want to have. Um, so that's the intention, and then there's the attention. You have to be, you know, you don't have to take it when it comes. You have to be ready to to, yeah, where, to be, you know. Oh, that's where it is. It's that's like it. perhaps I've never surfed, but it's perhaps like watching the wave and knowing, like I want that big wave, and mm -hmm. it's having the attention to see that it's coming. Yeah, knowing absolutely. it's scary. Yeah, but you have to look at the ocean if you want that big wave. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. no. if it's there, you, you, you have to. So that's the attention. And then there's the no tension, which is the hard part, I think, is to let go of the whole thing. Like, I'm okay either way. I'm happy. Oh, is it the this or something better you wanted to say? No, no, no. Because that's actually the no tension is, you know, I'm happy with this or it could be something better. Is it no attention or no tension? No tension. Right. So, so, so it's intention. You start with intention. Yeah. You continue with attention. You do your part and you're sure that you're looking at the ocean. Yeah. If it's the wave you're looking for. And then you have no tension. You're not like very attached to the idea that it has to be right now or it has to yeah. be perfect or it has to be in this special way or it has to happen. If it's not happening, I'm not doing it right. It, it, chill. Your tension so the, to, will, to be will in the block piece, you'd the say, you'd universe say, kind of. Yeah. You call yeah, it so, being in the flow state. Or exactly. without narratives, I use the word narratives quite a lot when I'm working with people. Mm -hmm. uh, they will use language about themselves, like I'm not good at this, or I should do this, or I mm -hmm. should do that, and um, and being aware of what your narratives are because the narratives are quite powerful. They can have quite a powerful hold up over you, I think, and yeah. that can get well. in the way of the universe sorting things out beautifully for you. It can yes. get in the way of your luck. Almost. But they get in the way of your attention because your narrative actually is the filter that you 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 you, you look at the world. So you can't actually see it when it happens if you yeah. have the wrong quote unquote um, narrative going yeah. on. We actually have a um, thing that is down the same line, which we call when you do what is difficult, life becomes easy. And, and sometimes we take it when we are super hungry and we live on this vegan, gluten-free uh, diet yeah. on, the road. on the road and it's super hard. And But then you go into a supermarket and if you are into organic uh, produce, uh, then it's very easy. You don't have to you buy the five things they yeah, yeah. have and then you eat them. And yeah. then you walk out of the supermarket. It's, it's actually kind of easy. You don't need to take yeah. stand on all these hundreds and hundreds of uh, things that are in a supermarket. It's like, okay, these three, there we it's go. It's a yeah. very simple example of if you do what is hard, your life becomes easy. Yeah. And, and it's also what you describe this process of actually making things very complex. And sometimes, you know, I, you ended your story at Bali, I think, in, in yeah. a accommodation, maybe not perfect. Yeah. Or beautiful and adventurous and lovely to share stories about afterwards but maybe it was no fun actually living there no it was absolutely so we were in this hut well, it wasn't a hut it was a enclosed and it's three bedrooms upstairs and then downstairs traditional Balinese just tiled floor and out into the garden mm -hmm. and um I pretty much went mad there so you know, like if <laughs> if I was on Instagram, hard for me to imagine. It would look amazing. Like it would look amazing. Mm -hmm. But the reality was, and it was amazing. You know, we'd get this takeout. Delicious food would come. This little man would come down the gate. It was in the middle of nowhere, backing onto this jungle, and he would shout Bali Buddha and bring this you know beautiful salad every evening for no money. And you know there was a cleaner, and she was sweet, and it was all like really nice. And I got a little car hired a car and we drive to this drumming circle and it was it was like really great and everyone who 
would have heard about it, would have heard all of that. But the thing that made me go mad were the ants. I don't know if you've <laughs> been to Asia, but like, imagine you've got two children, right? And they're eating a bit of bread or a bit of porridge in the morning. And if you didn't clean every single little crumb. Second, was, in the second it, draw, it touches yeah. the floor, you remove it. You've got like a whole motorway of ants <laughs> i'd come down in the morning and i'd be sweeping them up and i was just kind of going mad with it and charlie didn't care she was like you just sweep them up who cares whereas in my head it was and it's really it was really interesting i almost uh, it was like i started <laughs> meditating upon it what is it the ants are trying to tell me like <laughs> I, and they i think in retrospect they were trying to tell me here we go you cannot control life it's an illusion to think that you're in control of anything and surrender is key and here's me here's me trying to change the jungle i'm living in the jungle (laughs) even if i had walls and doors they'd have been underneath anyway but here's me trying to like sweep up every evening rather than doing some yoga i'd be (laughs) like downstairs for an hour like cleaning everything and and so i think the lesson there was that you'll go mad if you try and control the ants everything <laughs> but it is this um uh, this like the narrative you described before you had this narrative or this um, idea that ants equals not clean or not looking good enough after your family or something yeah, well, i was being invaded the ants. I, yeah i was having dreams yeah. about them it's horrible mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, but you have to remove that idea yeah to surrender to the jungle and, and it was and, and it, happiness that was readily available it's yeah. only when it's only w- almost right towards the end of something that i realized you know it's like when it's ending i can see the beauty in it and and when i've left you know so yeah so many... maybe that's a good thing i mean maybe we take with us the good memories yeah as long i hope you can see some beauty while and, it's going and the on. lessons the lessons learned throughout mm. it yeah we we actually returned to new zealand two years after that and and had the same experience of of buying a van but this time with less money in the bank and another child so you know we needed a bigger and better van and what we got was a smaller and worse van and uh, (laughs) if anybody's in the market for a smaller and worse van it's the Mazda Bongo with the pop top don't get it (laughs) we've got but uh, but Martin um, uh, about your your kids and schooling why haven't you just sent them to school Uh, why not choose the the normal way of doing things I like to think about first principles and what does success look like, right? And the first, the, the most important question I think for me is what is what is a life well lived? How do you live well? And so I suppose in part, schooling has come about uh, as a result of my in a substandard school experience. I wasn't very happy at school. Not that I was depressed, but I just didn't. You know, I was not in with the cool crowd. I didn't. I wasn't like on all the football teams having having my best life you get some children and they seem to really thrive in schools in that environment and that's great but I was quite shy and I was quite academic but I certainly struggled in some subjects and so I think I've carried that through that that kind of belief that it wasn't great and and um and we didn't feel like our first child was ready not that she was ready in the uk you're in school at four years old way too early and we looked at we looked around and you can see that obviously in europe there are countries where it's six or seven and we just like arbitrary numbers like you were saying you know we're we're you're ready now you're four just like they say right you're ready another kind of ageism exactly you should have given birth after 40 weeks you know mm-hmm. so that's the gestation period but in other countries it's 39 weeks so you're late you know so we're going to inject you full of drugs and force the child out of you so there's mm-hmm. so i suppose it feeds into questioning systems and um so first hand experience and then questioning systems um of kind of control and power uh and also asking looking forward so i suppose like think consciously thinking what are the skills that are going to be required to thrive in life and for me that's emotion like grounded emotion 
being able to express your emotions and feeling like you have choice and autonomy because we assume that most adults do and yet we somehow feel that it's okay to essentially imprison children from the age of four with no choice oh you're enjoying art next next lesson you know I remember school we uh, we had an activity week at school where if you had money you'd go off skiing and we didn't have money that year so I spent a week in the art class um but usually art was half an hour and then so I thought I was terrible at art I loved it for a whole week I could just get in really into yeah. something so I could deep dive and I really enjoyed that I really remember it um so the feeling that you don't get the opportunity to deep dive and follow your interests and so that's kind of how we've got to home education I wouldn't call it unschooling there's definitely a uh it's not it's always on my mind, perhaps more so my wife's mind, that it's a tension between getting some grades that are going to be useful to open up doors if you did want to go on and, and get a degree as an architect or if you wanted to, yeah, whatever you want to do. Uh, so there's a tension between like not doing any exams or doing some exams and so I'm tasked with uh, the laptop is 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 propped on a book here. I thought I'd prop it on this book so I could mention it. Uh, not really. Teach your child to read in a hundred easy lessons. That's the book that's under the laptop now. And um, thinking about what is my role, I'm here to teach them how to read and um, maths. I'm getting into maths, even with the kind of nine year old to use these labels. It's difficult for me. I'm back to school. Can I do it? I don't, mm. I don't have to do everything at the woods there's a maths teacher I can outsource bits of it it's it's kind of I think the uh, don't they say a child needs or well, we all need a village you know it takes a village to raise a man right mm. I'm not good at everything and that's why I want my children to be surrounded by happy grounded adults and children of all ages who are kind of yeah, I want to go to that forest. Yeah, yeah, it's like really it. nice. <laughs> it's super cool. It's really, mm. it's really great. And the people that run it are really, they say yes. And they say, yeah, like I've just set up on a Sunday, something called Sunday sessions with somebody who lives there. She's got this health hut and we're running a, a circle where people can just come in and we're just kind of shaping it. However, the people that turn up do it right so that they said yes to my friend here who wanted to set up a food business they said yeah just test it out mm -hmm. you know because they know how important it is for people to do stuff they're passionate about so so i think back to your question which was how come homeschool you didn't choose school yeah 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 i think it's broken as a system i think it serves to it serves the the few you know yeah. um and it's it's uh yeah a form of imprisonment at its most extreme or you know no just, I totally agree I don't yeah. find it extreme it is a prison yeah it is a prison is. and and so yeah I'm I'm interested in in nurturing free thinking individuals who have mm -hmm. autonomy over their own minds and bodies and yeah. how they choose and I'm not perfect I'm, I'm you know none of us are we're not you know like I, I suppose you might say you'll be judged on your results you know um but define success yeah, right and, and, that's and the, it's, it's not um, fun for a child to be your result right yeah i mean i should be able to define myself and judge myself and let myself be judged on who i am and <laughs> that's a really good not point on what yeah. they are capable of but i, I think, think that's very important there's a really big culture of of how how your kids are doing you know so oh my my children have got these grades they're off exactly, to this university yeah. they've got my this job. Son's a doctor yeah and okay, good on him not so on what you. is he happy are you happy yeah how do you live well how's your relation with that son yeah yeah, yeah. can i and, i'm sitting on something can i give you yeah please what well, again one piece of advice on the reading yeah. thing the reading thing i'm very passionate about it because it took me forever to learn how to teach kids to read oh yeah yeah and my best advice is this don't do it right please you read them stories because you like stories you read books yourself because you want to read the book yeah. reading is a culture but do not teach the children yeah. and they learn like this it's crazy I've seen it in real life right, and I right. wouldn't believe it. We had 
in our story as, as um, home educators, we had a great failure with our first. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> like yeah. huge, like in yeah. shit. He got um, stubborn and didn't so want to learn to read. got angry and yeah. decided that he would never learn to read. Yeah. And what would we do about it? And, um, well, basically, he finally decided to learn to read. And then he learned. But it was not because I was helping him. <laughs> <laughs> it was his decision and he was I think 13 at the time he decided and it was because there was this book he wanted to read yeah he was listening to audiobooks uh, because he couldn't read and he didn't mind and uh, he had decided never to learn to read um, and because we had pushed him in the wrong way yeah uh, at the wrong time in the wrong context and he decided to learn to read as when he was 13 because there was this audio book and book two was not available as yeah. audio. Yeah. And the thing was, it was not even translated into Danish. And the book was so interesting. He decided, I need to learn to speak English and I need to learn to read a book. So he did. And he did it in like two months. <laughs> yeah. After hardly, you know, he could hardly read his own name. Can I ask you a question then? Where did your motivation to, let's say, push or to to get him to it? Where where was that coming from? Uh, from <laughs> me and society. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. No, actually, first it because we have a twenty three year old, mm -hmm. and so this first I'm talking about is the first home educated child who is now seventeen, I'm... and twenty three year old she was in a free school in Copenhagen, very very free and lovely school. And we thought our second child would be in that school. Yeah. So closing in on the time that he would start in school, I realized that he was, he's a very spiritual child, very highly sensitive, very much himself. He's not weak. It's not weakness. It's just, he's in his own state. And I thought learning to read plus learning to be in school will be too much for him. Yeah. So I'll teach him to read before he starts. And, and the context of that is that me and my siblings all learned to read when we were four or five years old. And our oldest child learned to read when she was five. So for me, it was not a thing. In Denmark, you start when you're six. Yeah. So when he was five, I thought, okay, I'll just, you know, teach him to read. It'll take me like two weeks and that's it. So he got annoyed with that. And then when he didn't start schooling, Jesper said that, okay you can homeschool but then he has to learn to read yeah so i knew if i'm not teaching anxiety you know of uh or, of other people of a p of other people's judgment on you when you do something that is out of the ordinary when you homeschool uh it's like ooh, what would people think um there is so this you wanted British, them what to would like... the neighbors say kind yeah. of feeling inside yeah, no, of absolutely you. and it, what's interesting also is when couples when we come together and we have we come at it from slightly different angles or we come at it with our own stuff don't we of course. and obviously um, obviously and you have you he, i'm not very nice to be honest i'm like so much come on you and so i'm not nice i mean i'm not she's very I'm, nice but powerful but i'm not not i i'm not compliant and i'm not like going to obey things to be nice i'm nice because i like people and and I, I like to to be in a in a state of, of love and compassion and taking care of each other, but I'm not nice in order to be nice or to yeah. be perceived as nice. And that way I'm not nice. I'm very I do my thing and there is nothing that will stop me. And that's why I call me and myself an anarchist, because I will never a rule will not stop me from doing what I believe is right. Yeah. I just know this. So and he's very nice. My husband is a very nice guy. He wants everybody to feel good. And, and if that, you know, he's just, you know, he's very nice. And I think that's the very big difference yeah, yeah. in that situation. When we started to homeschool, I was, you know, I wouldn't care less what the world around me would think about the situation. But he was yeah. kind of not afraid, but no, no, you but wouldn't also, be bother to feel but safe. Also the one being out in the world gives another pressure on you when you go to work and you meet people and they're like oh you homeschool but the, the first question you get is 
can the read and the write where it's a little different pressure when you are at home with the children of course yeah but no but then okay i'm just trying to yeah. to interfere with your reading process with your children actually yeah you, you're you're a disruptor i I'm like just, this yeah yes. I'm not nice as I say. No, I'm just saying, like in my personal experience as a home educator, once I let go of this teaching them how to read, they learn to read like so smoothly. The two last ones. So the, the third child, she learned to read while I was trying to teach the other one to read. She right. got interested and, and she could read when she was four. And she read her first full novel when she was like six or seven. Right. So and she did it on her own. I didn't even teach her the alphabet. I mean, I answered the questions when she asked me something, but it was not a teaching situation and I had no agenda. And my fourth child, he learned to read when he was eight. And I got a little butterflies in the stomach there because I was like, is this another mm. late reader? Because I'm OK with it. But. It's a little complicated with the world. It is complicated with people around yeah. you when you unschool, you live in a bus and yeah. walk barefoot and, and then the kids can't read, you know, it, it can get you into trouble. So we were observing the situation with some emotion involved. <laughs> but what happened was that he started reading in three languages. Right. So once he started, he could read in, in English, Danish and Spanish which is not the same system. So it took longer time. So obviously it took longer time. Yeah. And now he's the one I described yesterday, reading out loud, loud doing voice acting in his second language. So, and, and what my point is, it's like teaching them to walk. You don't teach your children to walk. You hold yeah. their hand for a while. If they stretch out their arm, hopefully. You know, they see you walking and they observe. They see you walk. Everybody's walking. So they walk at some point. They get up and walk. And, and because we live in a culture of text and language, written language and books and, and also on the computer, the internet, everything, there's so much text everywhere. They learn to read. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's. It, and the it's, lessons are not helping. That's my point. Yeah. The lessons no, are not helping. The lessons are making the kids feel stupid. Whereas and, and, put them on your lap and read them a good story that yeah. makes them feel loved and that reading is something amazing. And then they suddenly they can read. Yeah, that uh, that sounds good to me. I think my wife has more of the judgment when you were talking there. It's like, yes, it's the judgment yeah. of others. Um, and I give less of a shit, but I'm still I'm probably in between the two of you or where you both were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but it is a, a difficult thing that I think all of us need to face. And when you choose a life different uh, than than what is the norm, then you are more aware of that. Oh, am I doing this because of what other people would say or think about me? Yeah, um, yeah. What's driving the? Yeah, you must be able to do do this by this that, age. That's how we started identifying as unschoolers because right. we realized that all the quote unquote teaching we did we actually did it because we were afraid of the system the school yeah. system that would come and check on us it's and the we same were, in the UK. Yeah. yeah yeah but my fear As families mother-in-laws mothers yeah. no, you know, I, was I was not afraid of your mother no no no, no. but no, no. i was afraid because they have real power yeah they could actually interfere with our life your mother no, she's not nice in yeah, she, absolutely so um, no the thing was, I was afraid that the school system would come and check on us and find yeah. it not good enough and start forcing us into the school system or to do things we didn't want to do. So every day I thought I would teach the children. Yeah. Most days I didn't. And I felt guilty about it. And some days I did. And there was a lot of negative emotion. And that's, it was just a bad situation. That's for the, the space that I'm in. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm, I feel conflicted because I, I suppose intuitively... Or not intuitively i just want to go out and have fun with them mm -hmm. um, but i'm at home it's winter i'm in the house the house is always a bit messy there's always like things to do that isn't going out and having fun with them i mean it might be different in the summer but Maybe um, they can have fun with each other yeah yeah i um they all i mean there are other options than you know schooling at home or going out having fun you could also just have fun at home 
yeah 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 they uh the the children are all really into minecraft or the younger three yeah. and uh, it's amazing the four-year-old within this he, he fell and broke his arm a few weeks ago and um, they say that children after they've been ill they can have developmental leaps i don't know if you've ever heard of this um after especially after i think it's specifically in the context of having a virus and getting a a, a, a really big fever they mm -hmm. can you know they can wake up and they can read you know yeah, um, yeah. and um I watched him on Minecraft. There he is. I mean, the day after he broke his arm, he's doing Lego. He only he broke his left arm, but he loves Lego. And he's doing Lego with his good hand and his mouth. You know, he's he's improvising <laughs> straight away. It's amazing. <laughs> how Nothing he, will stop him. Yeah. Nothing will stop him. And then this Minecraft, I was watching him and I was thinking, how do you know how to do this? The, when you watch a young person that's <laughs> native on a device, right? It's just like ding, ding, ding. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. He, he's four and he's just picked it up just by observing how do I walk? You look around you and, mm -hmm. you know, he observes it because he sits with his older brother who watches hours of YouTube mm -hmm. videos on how to do Minecraft. Mm -hmm. So he knows how to do it, but he's internally self-motivated to do so, isn't he? He really wants to. And also, this is another thing I think we have to get over as parents, home educating parents. We think we are the educators. Right, we yeah. think we, the, the knowledge comes from us to the children, maybe through a book we give them or yeah. something that comes from us, but it doesn't. In reality, it comes from the curiosity of the child. They go out and explore the world. And sometimes we get to be the helper or yeah. we get to get along on, on the walk to the explore, exploring. I have had, we have had so, so many experiences with our children now they are a bit older now and where we're like how do you know that why what, how did yeah. you i mean i live with them even <laughs> in a van you know I, i'm with them 24 7 you've kept this extra language how do you know from? this i remember <laughs> yeah. and this is a long time ago yeah. we were at the louvre in paris mm -hmm. and it was a very hot day and we went to see the lady as we call the mona lisa we have yeah. it's like a ritual we go to see the lady when we're in paris and it was just a very hot day and you can't take off your t-shirt at the Louvre. And it was very, they have this glass ceiling and it was like an oven. So we were like, okay, what can we do? We go to the basement. They have the, I can't say Egyptian. this in English. I can't say this in English. E Egyptologic. How do you say it in English? Like things from old Egypt collection. Yeah, old old yeah. stuff collection. Yeah. Things no, stolen. no, no, Egypt. Things Egypt. stolen from Egypt. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think artifacts, I can. The Egyptian. Artifacts for me. It's called Egyptological, whatever. I don't know. We went to see things from Egypt in the yeah. basement at the Louvre. And there I am. And Storm, he is nine. And he cannot read. We're like four years before he can read. And he starts to lecture the whole family in a nice way. I don't know if lecture is the right yeah. word to use. But in a nice way, explaining all of us about all of the hieroglyphs. Like this one means this, and this one, you see how the head is like different. That's because 200 years later, they changed it and they changed all of them. So see, here's one original and here's one. And he was like, I'm not like, how? how? I don't know this. Yeah. We never talked about it. We didn't watch a movie. I don't know to this day. I don't know where he knew it from, but he knew. So I think this is what, just like we think we have to teach them to read. Yeah. I think the idea that we're the center of their educational universe is wrong and this is something we have to get over but yeah and it, it leads me oh, shit, my leg is like yeah it, it leads me on um, this how do we know what we think how do we know what our children needs to live a fantastic life how and and i remember some to be emotionally grounded is yes one that's this. one of them yeah. we cecilia and i talked about it at some point when we had some anxiety many years ago about being homeschoolers and i sat down and really thought about what is it i want from my children when they are out of not our care but our uh, in the world near, yeah then it's like okay emotionally grounded is one of them uh being self-sustainable uh, so they don't need to be dependent on the state necessarily. They should be able to. This is economics. Yeah, know, they should need yeah, to yeah. be able to feed and uh, put clothes and the roof yeah. over their head. And th those are the two most important ones. And then for me, there's like if they can find and nurture a passion, 
then life is on so many levels more easy because you just have a drive towards what you find fun. Um, and then to if you can ground yourself and do the other things, then I think you will be able to find love and a community around you. Yeah, I, I can't disagree with any of that. I mean, amen to all of that, really. That's the that's... hard part. The hard part is to let go of the idea that they also need the curriculum of math and the world yeah. history and the three or four languages and the grammar. And I find that to, in all fairness, it came from him, all the pressure in the beginning. Yeah. But then when we realized we're doing all this in order to serve our fear of the state, our children are paying with their time and their self-esteem. So rather we should be courageous and give them their freedom. And should the day come where the, the state is knocking our door and want to check on us, we will have to pick our fight and, and, and stand up for it. And, and until that day, let them be free and happy. And that was very easy for my husband. He could just let go. You know, he was like, I don't care if they can read and write. I don't care if they can do any math or know anything about world war, whatever. I don't care as long as they're happy. For me, this has been harder. Can I ask one, one part of that? Uh, and then you can ask. <laughs> Sorry. We should no, shut no, up for yeah, no, no, but yeah. one part of that I actually think comes from me being um, very kind of uneducated. I had a big interest in making movies when I was like 15, 16 years old, made an amateur feature film, wanted to go to the film school and stuff like that. I only went to high school because that was my parents only uh, like you can do whatever you want, but please do this at least. Yeah. So I did that. Um, because he's nice. Yeah, but, but the nice uh, <laughs> boy from uh, the suburbs, you know. Mm. Uh, but then later in life, I talked with my dad about it, about uh, should I take a university degree? Should I go down the old normal road? And, and he said something to me that lingered, which was... Uh, Back when I started uh, my life, Jesper, um, as an adult, then what I ended up doing for the majority of my career wasn't invented when I, it was time to go to university. Yeah. And if I look at my same life, uh, my own life, it's kind of the same. I ended up with 20 years in the media industry, but on the internet with the World Wide Website. Um, and the ET University of Copenhagen was grounded the year I started full-time working inside that industry. So I would have had to wait five years to start my career. It would just have been stupid. Um, so for me, I think the choosing, choosing not to go to university and, and just giving um, a flying uh, fuck about it was for me, I always believed I could make it, that I could find my way that I didn't need a support system to do it. So when we came back to what our children needed, I was like, they don't need to go to university uh, unless they they find it fun. I, I'm a really big skeptic of university now. It's very expensive to go, and I think it's terrible value for money. Um, you should go if you love a subject, but I don't think enough people love their subject and my in my line of work I'd, I'd work with people who'd been in a line of work for maybe 20 years and I'd ask them how long have you enjoyed being an accountant they said well never but it pays well <laughs> I said well that's number one problem you know yeah. what, and, and then I say to them what do you what do you what are you passionate about it's the um Ica guy have you heard of Ica guy um Ica guy if uh, I-K-A-G-A-I it's the Japanese um philosophy of I'm, I'm doing a disservice you'll need to look it up but the the essence of it is how to live well and um there are if you examine these three or four i can't remember the fourth but the three i remember they're very important questions what are you passionate about what are you good at and what motivates you these are kind of english interpretations but if mm -hmm. you look up Ica guy it's it's the the belief that kind of what you do with your life is at the cross section of what motivates you what you're really passionate about and what you're, what you're good at and um i don't think we're taught enough about or not even taught yet yeah, so school doesn't teach you no, how but to the thing is the thing is the whole structure of the school system doesn't you know it's not individual everybody goes through the same thing yeah. so it's not about what you are passionate about no that's that's no. not 
in the matrix of it. And, and yeah. I think one of the big problems of of being schooled is that you don't get to find out what you're passionate about. You don't get to be bored. You don't get to feel unsettled, annoyed, frustrated because you're not fulfilled. Uh, you don't get to make bad choices about the structure of your day or your week or your week yeah. year. You don't get to realize that there's something you really need to know. You really want to know it because it was really annoying not knowing it in an XIY situation because you don't make any decisions on what you're doing. That's why it's the prison thing. You yeah. get up in the morning at a certain hour, not when you're done sleeping. Put your uniform hour. in. You I'm... put on your uniform oh. or not uniform, but you, you leave at a certain hour. You you you, you jump when they yeah. say jump and you yeah. learn what they teach you. You should learn and, and you learn to be happy if you get the good grades and sad if you don't. And you even learn, you said before some kids are thriving. Yeah, maybe they are. But right. they learn that, oh, I'm the one thriving. Yeah. You know, and, and they don't learn to figure out they would maybe they would rather knit all day. Yeah. Or sing yeah. all day. Or go for a long walk after lunch. They're just good at the things that you're supposed to be good at. at and, and luck on that. What do we call that? Lucky you. You know, it's good for them. Good on them, I think you say in English. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't teach even the thriving children and they they will not learn from experience what makes them happy that's the catch yeah. for everyone everyone it was, uh, it, it was really interesting doing my work trying to help somebody unravel years of conditioning mm. in six sessions you just can't do it almost no. so i would i would just be playful and just be interested in who they were and mm. you know, just just let the stories flow and um that's kind of why i found it fascinating really yesterday cecilia and i talked about uh, ownership of your child um mm. and and because if you look at a child do they own themselves or do you own them a lot of kids grow up with not choosing their own clothes uh, some of them grow up with not having an ownership over their own hair. Somebody tells them when their hair needs to be cut. What does that actually say to a person about being them, about how they are present in the world if they cannot decide over their own body? And with the school, they don't decide when to eat, uh, when to go to the toilet. Uh, and it's just wild to think of how that affects you. Yeah. And if you're if you're homeschooling or unschooling, you you might presume that you give less of a shit about what others think, you know. And so you know, like have have you have your kids brushed their hair, and you know, are they wearing shoes, and all this kind of this fear of judgment of others. Yeah. But certainly, I'm I'm I always thought that home education. You, you're kind of crusty and like hippie and you know you've got dreadlocks and you've got rainbow clothes and things like that and there are many different ways of doing it but I certainly um I look at my children who've got I mean my yeah all my children have got long hair my youngest boy he's got you know everybody says he's got you know like oh yeah, yeah. same in our family yeah years, you know and um and I just think what people say to you says more about them than it does about what they're observing it's their own it's their own fear or projection onto the child whether it's thinking about oh um, you know they're not reading yet or you know don't you want to cut their hair or you know don't you want to mm. wear a nice dress because you're a girl that kind of mm. thing it's it's, mm. it's all on them and and actually raising children to give less of a shit about what other people think of them I think is part of what I'm interested in I think it's a very nice question to find the balance because i think also not giving a shit not a shit at all as that's not what i'm aiming for because mm -hmm. i also want for myself being this not very nice person and for my children to be able to balance carrying themselves as as they are feeling that they are okay and and whatever they find 
right is right, but still caring about the people around them, how they are perceived and how comfortable people we meet or people we are in some sort of relation with, how they feel about the whole thing. I think actually, and and because what we do is rare, it's more rare where we come from than it is where you come from, mm. but it's still rare. We We will always be some kind of representative of the homeschooling yeah. Uh, yeah. community so if it's if it's very much rainbow clothes and dreadlocks and bare feet that has not been washed for two years and um minecraft at the restaurant and you know yeah. very much of this mm, maybe dirty clothes maybe yeah. things that we make a bad case for everyone else coming after us and yeah. we don't teach the surrounding society anything good about who we are and what we're doing so actually i tell my children to comb their hair <laughs> and i tell them to change the t-shirt i tell them to take a shower i tell them to cut their nails i'm not telling them that they have to if they like really no i don't yeah, want to yeah, cut yeah. my nail i want to have long nails okay it's your nails but i will share with them the price of it what will be perceived in the reality that we live in because we don't live in a hippie community we drive around in our van in all of europe and we find ourselves in so many different contexts you can't yeah. take off your t-shirt at the louvre you'll be kicked out yeah. and and if you want to talk to people they have to perceive you as a somewhat interesting nice person integrated yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know three day old ketchup on the t-shirt is just not a good sign to send yeah. So there's a balance here. It's not all just freedom. Yeah, you're right. You're yeah. It's not freedom, anarchy, and and middle fingers. That's not where I am. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I was just um, joining some dots in my head, and I realised that I was talking about New Zealand, and part of the inspiration for travel as well, going to New Zealand, was because of somebody who I think you've recently interviewed, oh, who's yes. our old neighbour, um, yeah. Lucy. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So we stayed with them in their yurt and, you know, they were True off, that. Now I remember. Yeah. You know, they were living off grid and mm. they just arrived in New Zealand and, and we kind of kind of gate crashed their woofing place. And we were <laughs> know, living in the van there and kind of hanging around and saying, how do we get around your country? But they've lived a really, you know, they were our neighbors in London living a normal life and they, they sold up and traveled around Europe first in a, Volkswagen T25 and a Type 3 and you know did that thing and then and then he's he's a native Kiwi but they they really went went brave and hard on you know buying a bit of land and living in a yurt and all of that yeah, and I, it's a I really brave story yeah yeah and I haven't heard the the interview yet but um they their bravery is very inspiring and certainly mm -hmm. part of our journey in giving us the confidence about knowing what you want. And it's a very personal thing to you, isn't it? Like where you're, uh, where you're, I uh, don't know if it's boundaries, but you know, you, you're like, actually brush your hair because it's, you know, it's just going to lubricate the wheels of, of the, you know, this is where my yeah. boundaries are. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's really interesting and important i think to surround yourself with difference otherness mm -hmm. there's exactly. not one formula for living mm -hmm. let mm -hmm. alone home educating or unschooling there are many different ways of doing it and being around different people i think is really great and healthy mm -hmm. yeah that's why we travel around in different cultures and meet different people and we yeah. never really were attracted to at least not full-time living in communities because exactly this, they close around, you know, being right. And they are very often very right. It's just, there's not much contrast. And I think the reality has many layers and levels and it's a good thing to, for our children and, and for us to be able to, yeah, walk into the Louvre as well as, you know, sit on a beach playing guitar yeah. and having a bonfire with all the other barefoot hippies. It's it's yeah. just different social settings and different elements of life and and it, different 
social languages if you want yeah so it's, it's a richness thing. isn't it it's a richness you're you're yeah. learning you, it's like um you know like a lot of people if you imagine there's a spectrum of of living and most people are in in here and mm -hmm. in there there are highs and lows and there are extremes and of of all different things of of, of cultures and uh, uh yeah educational models and work and everything isn't it it's uh so i i I commend the way you're traveling. I think it's amazing. My question, I know we're almost yes, out. Yes, let's do it. Was, uh, to what extent was the motivation for getting up and into the van motivated by the, uh, not fear, but, you know, the, the oh, the authorities ob observing us. You know, if we get in the van, they can't, you know, see you later. <laughs> Come and get us if you can. Yeah, Catch yeah. us if you can. <laughs> I think it was more the other way around. It was other things motivating us to get into the van and go. Right. But it was a great Proud advantage. As a bonus. Yeah, we, kn we knew once we're in the van, we're safe. See you later. Yeah, yeah. it was see you later. It was, yeah. you know, we can just, in our language, we say leave the bakery if you don't like the smell. Yeah, but it's also the the, the really fun, <laughs> we can leave the bakery. Yeah. The really fun thing, Martin, was you know um, in Denmark we are less than one percentage, less than a half percentage that uh, homeschool, right. uh, and even unschooling is uh, weird. And when we started back then, there were maybe ten families maximum. Um, nowadays, it's getting more and more common um, among others because people share about it. More people get their eyes open, mm -hmm. but w when we were in Denmark, homeschooling our kids, unschooling them. When we talked with people about it, there was kind of, that's a little weird. That's uncommon. I haven't heard about that. What are you doing? How will your children survive? And uh, to, uh, will they ever be able to read and do math and all these things? But as soon as we started our full-time traveling, that skepticism became interest. It's like, oh man, I always wanted to travel. What a dream come true. Oh my and God, stop. Great education. We are doing the same. Stop it. That, 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 that is absolutely what we experience so much, even when... Well, you have the reverse situation, I suppose. How do you mean? That you traveled for a long time and now you're based in one place and, and, yeah. and you get all this. How will they... It's rather interesting just, um, yeah, having lived the... Got out of the matrix. I feel like we got out of the matrix mm -hmm. and then but we've kind of consciously gone back into it. Mm -hmm. You know, like Charlie's doing a very normal, like, you know, clever job. job. Yeah. And I'm at home with the kids, but actually in many ways, it's kind of like, I don't think we would have continued traveling, 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 traveling. Um, it's just like chapters of a book, you know, yeah. it's chapters of a book. And yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, we're in a chapter now and we're, we bought a wreck of a house that we'll do up and we could sell it in two years and move to Mexico or, or stay here for 20 years. We don't I'm, know. I mm. don't know. I'm, I'm comfortable mm. with not knowing. Yeah. 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 Sitting with not knowing, I think it's a really. I hope you're still uh, staying long enough for us to come visit. Well, we're going to be in. Uh, where are we? We're doing a little trip with all the people from the woods. Actually, we're coming to the south of France, near Toulouse, in the uh, end start of September. And so, I think we're going to be in France maybe for September, but here here in the summer certainly. Yeah, we will drop Perfect. by. Perfect. Excellent. We'll You're going to make it. You're going to make it. This, so yeah, this definitely. I've got all the papers right this time. <laughs> <laughs> and what I know it? which ones I don't have. Which Okay. It was an admin done. error, was it? Admin. Uh, it was admin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was admin. And not it meant was, to be this it, was, it was not meant to be. Exactly. Yeah. It was just the universe you know, knocking us in a different yeah, yeah, yeah. direction. But yeah, this time, yeah. we have a shuttle on the 17th of July, and we are coming. Cool. Lovely. Look we're going to the home education family festival are you coming there oh where's that that's um, october in the north ish like two hours north of london in august late august. august oh cool i don't know about that you have to send me the details yeah we will, I will. We will. and we will, will share them in the show notes and we should kind of wrap up yeah, because we we've been talking for hours and i know yeah I know. If anybody's still with us, thank you for listening. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's lovely. It just—it's a very personal thing, isn't it? I just feel like I've been chatting to you, but perhaps with one 
one eye that somebody might be listening but hopefully it's been of uh, interest and value to somebody it's been very nice to talk to you Mm, yeah but it's just for me it's just nice to connect with you again and Mm. Mm. i feel yeah like when you know when you connect with people and uh, there's a nice saying i don't know if you've heard of it friends are for a reason a season or a lifetime Mm -hmm. sometimes you meet people and you're okay with not not speaking to them all the time because you know that you'll just always know them yeah I think that's what he saw in you. Like Jesper, he told me, like, look at that guy over there. I think he's a friend. Mm. Like, so yeah, that's how I felt. I, yeah. I felt. I felt a brotherly yeah. love for you. Mm-hmm. Just, and that was it. It was just, you just know. Yeah, yeah. perfect. That's why I want to end this conversation on yeah. the we're coming thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we are coming. Yeah. Excellent. Lovely to see you. And we'll have a great hug. Indeed. I've really enjoyed it. Okay. Thanks a lot for your time, Martin. Ciao, Thank Martin. You. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you liked it, then please share it with all your friends and family. We would also love it if you gave our podcast a review. Thanks. And if you want to support our podcast and work, then you can find us on patreon.com slash the Conrad family. We will continue to travel full time. And if you want to tag along, then please follow us on Facebook and Instagram at the Conrad family. And you can also read more than 100 blog posts on our website, theconrad.family. Until next time, make a wonderful day. Thank you.